All right, so one quick announcement, just, just real quick, one quick announcement is, you know, next Sunday we normally have our home groups where we meet, we have church in the home, and uh, we will not be doing that in our homes next Sunday because of Thanksgiving. We didn't want to make the people that are doing it have to clean their house and all that stuff over Thanksgiving. So we're going to have a, a home group here at the church. We're going to have breakfast. We'll send you an email out this week giving you the details of what to bring, or probably won't even make you bring much. We'll probably provide most of it. But anyway, we'll give you that. We'll send that email out to you. So just know that we'll be meeting here next Sunday, but it'll be a different kind of service. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 14, 26. When you gather together, each one has a word, a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song, a tongue, an interpretation of a tongue. So remember to try to come to church with uh, seeking the Lord of what he would have you to bring. So anyway, that's that announcement. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And as I mentioned last Sunday, we've launched a, mess, a series called A Glorious Church. And we're really dealing with what it means to be a glorious church, but we're really zeroing in on the uh, phrase, a holy priesthood. God is raising up a holy priesthood. So 2 Peter, 2 Peter verse, chapter 2, verse 5, I'm going to open up with that. We're going to read just uh, three, uh, we're going to read actually three verses of Scripture to start. 2 Peter chapter, chapter 2, verse 5. Yeah, first, first Peter. Thank you. Thank you. First Peter chapter two, verse five is, and we talked about this last Sunday, but you also as living stones, and we spent a whole message talking about what it means to be a living stone fit together. You're being built up as a spiritual house. God's house is not a building. We all know that. God's house is not a building. God's house is comprised of people who are fit together as a living stone, fit together. And now uh, Peter says, for a holy priesthood. And that's going to be the focus here in this message is God is raising us up as a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 21. Ephesians 2, verse 21. And this, to me, this verse corresponds and correlates really well with 1 Peter. It's, it's really talking about the same thing. Where Paul is talking about, he says, in whom the whole building being fitted together, living stones fit together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So you individually are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the outer court. Your soul is the holy place. Your spirit is the holy of holies. We also corporately are being fit together to be a temple of the Lord, where there is a, a holy of holies dwelling place. God, I believe, wants every local church in his or original design for what the church is meant to be. The church is meant to be a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. God wants to have each churches be a holy of holy dwelling place of God in the Spirit, where God's glory dwells in whom you are being fit together or being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. God wants us as living stones fit together to be the spiritual house where the Spirit of God dwells in much greater dimensions, in much greater glory, and much greater power. But in the middle of that, God wants us to be a holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. So last week, we, and I mentioned what we talked about last week, but this week what we're going to talk about is this holy priesthood, what it means to be a holy priesthood. And so what it means both now and the here and now, so what we're talking about is not only related to eternity, but there is an eternal dimension to it. We begin to walk as a holy priesthood now, and in eternity. See, your destiny, I mentioned this 
I mentioned this just when we were in worship. Your destiny is so much more than doing something great for God. Your destiny, your inheritance is God himself. He's your inheritance. The priests in the Old Testament, they did not have any portion of the land because God was their inheritance. And so a lot of times we hear that and go, that, that sounds almost like bad news. I think, it, I think it really stresses to us how little we really know God, that, that that would sound like bad news to us. I can tell you the angels around God's throne who are crying out, holy, 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 beauty, 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 are not disappointed that God himself is their inheritance. See, your destiny, your eternal destiny is to be a priesthood that ministers to the Lord himself in the Holy of Holies. So much more than to do something great for God. So much of the church thinks, well, my destiny is to do something great for God. Now, I'm not saying God doesn't anoint people to do things for him. Certainly he does. But the ultimate destiny you have is not to be a minister in the outer court to people, but to be a minister in the holy of holies to the Lord himself. You don't seem very excited about that. That's pretty awesome. Pretty incredible that God has called us to be that priesthood. Now, that in context, as we talk about, this, this message is really focused on what that means to be this priesthood, both now and for eternity, and it's setting the stage for the heart surgery, so to speak, God wants to do, Hebrews 4.12, the, the word of God is living and active. It is like a sharp two-edged sword that pierces down into the division of soul and spirit, getting down to the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That, by the way, is said in the context of the priesthood. The book of Hebrews is all about the priesthood, the priesthood of Christ and our, our, us being partakers with Christ. So when God says in Hebrews 4.12, God wants to bring a sword to divide soul from spirit, to get to the heart, God is wanting to get to the heart because the heart is the core of everything and only the pure in heart We'll see God. This surgery that we're, we're going to go into over the next, I don't know how long it's going to take, is preparing us to be this holy priesthood. See, I, I think the church has lost this reality and this busyness of doing things for God. We've lost the reality that only the pure in heart will see God. I don't know about you, that's convicting. I don't know if you feel convicted. I feel convicted. I'm like, God, I want a pure heart. Hebrews 12 says, pursue holiness. For without it, no one will see the Lord. So this you know, we should be welcoming God's surgery to come because the, the, the dividing of soul and spirit is actually preparing our hearts to be that priesthood that gazes upon God for all eternity, but it's the pure in heart that, that are able to do that. I'm going to talk about that in, in upcoming messages. That's not really the message today. This message is mainly setting the context so that when we talk about that, we understand where this is going and what is unto. Does that make sense? So I want to talk about the holy priesthood, both how it relates to the here and now and the holy priesthood as it relates to eternity. God is preparing us for eternity. A lot of people don't want to talk about eternity, but I think it's so wise for us, like Moses, Lord, teach us to number our days. Give us a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. I mean, as you progress in age, you start realizing, man, this thing goes by really, really fast. 
I want to make sure I'm prepared for eternity. I want to be prepared now, but I also want to be prepared for eternity. And so talking about God's spiritual house, God's, God's spiritual house of living stones is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 7 through 12. I'm not going to turn there, but just kind of summarize it here for you. Paul is talking about the old covenant with Moses and the new covenant with the Spirit. And it's, it's really, you should read it, it's really stunning that Paul is writing. It almost sounds like, Paul, are you being serious? But this, he is being serious. Paul is saying to us, the glory Moses had under the old covenant. Now, keep in mind when Paul's saying this, he's talking about the time when Moses would go up to Mount Sinai and he would meet with God in the cloud and the glory of God was so intense that Moses literally had to take a, a veil and put it over his face because of fa his face was shining from the glory of the encounter with God. And Moses, or Paul says, that glory is nothing compared to the new covenant. That's what he said. Where's the glory? Where is that glory? I mean, you look at the language and Paul's saying that what did we have in the new covenant by the Spirit of God with the ministry of righteousness far surpasses that so that it seems like what Moses had wasn't even glorious at all. Yet he had to put a veil on his face to cover his, the shining radiance of God's glory from the encounter. Where is that glory? I mean, I doubt very seriously you're going to have to go leave this church service and put a veil on your face because the glory from this message or the glory from this worship, as great as the worship was, I'll let you judge the message, as great as that was, the glory is so intense that you start blinding people you come in contact with. But Paul says the glory of the new covenant is meant to be greater than even that. And I believe what Paul, what Paul was getting at was Ephesians 5.27, a glorious church. I believe the church of Jesus Christ before the Lord returns is going to be a glorious church. And this might be like one of those things where you're like, okay, it doesn't even need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. If Paul said there's going to be a glorious church, that means there has to be glory. There has to be glory. There's no such thing as a glorious church without glory. So I would say one of God's agendas here at the end of the age is to make every local church a dwelling place of God's glory. We need to recapture the vision of what Paul had in mind for the new covenant gathering of God's people. Is the glory of God is meant to come back to his church and a holy of holies expression of that. And we are meant to be a priesthood in the midst of glory that ministers to the Lord. See, our first ministry is a vertical ministry, not a horizontal ministry. Your first ministry is unto the Lord and then unto people. When we get the order reversed, everything gets out of order. When our order is to the people first and to God second, giving the people our first fruits, giving God our leftovers, it does not end well. So God would reverse that order and say, your ministry is first a vertical ministry to the Lord himself. Then it's a horizontal ministry to the people out of that encounter with God, out of that encounter with his presence. So that's, that's really what it means to be, that's what it means to be a holy priesthood in the here and now. I believe, even as we've titled this series, A Glorious Church, there is going to be an outpouring of the glory of God upon the church like we've never seen. I believe what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when he talked about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, I don't believe Paul even experienced that because you can read his language and he's saying, we have this hope. It was a hope for Paul. It was not yet a reality even for Paul. But I believe before the Lord returns, that dimension is going to be fulfilled in the church. That's incredible. 
That should drive us. That should be the vision. We should not settle for anything less but the glory of God in the church. And our role as a priesthood in that glory to minister to the Lord. So that's, that's the here and now. And I think we need that vision for the here and now that it's not just when we go into eternity. But I also believe we need to realize this priesthood that we are being prepared for is for all eternity. The eternal priesthood, our calling, our destiny is forever and ever. I'm going to quote Revelation, 20, or I'm going to speak from Revelation 22, 3 through 5, is the new city Jerusalem. It talks about the throne of God and of the Lamb was in it. And his bond servants, this is so beautiful, his bond servants, it says, serve him, but it actually means in the Greek, minister to him. That is, a, that is a ministry to the Lord before it's a ministry to the people for all eternity. And it says, this is amazing. And they see his face. Wow. I mean, I can't even comprehend what is it going to be like to behold the face of God and minister to him in the new city Jerusalem as a priest for all eternity? How incredible is that? That is your eternal destiny. And I guarantee you, if you saw the face of God, if I saw the face of God like it talks about in Revelation 22, we would never, ever, ever want to leave that place. It would be torture to come out from that place because it's so beautiful and so glorious and so stunning and so majestic and so breathtaking and so just awe-inspiring. In fact, that's one of the promises given to the overcomers of the Church of Philadelphia. He said, if you overcome, you will not go out from it anymore. Oh, that's an incredible promise, is that if we overcome, we can be a holy of holies dwelling uh, play. We can have a pe be a people who dwell in the holy of holies of God's eternal house forever, gazing on him. That's what we are being prepared for. That's what we are being trained for. That's why God is wanting to come to the heart of the matter because what we see in Revelation 22, 3 through 5, if they behold the face of God, that means they have pure hearts. They're only granted that ability to behold the face of God because God had done a prior work in their heart before they got into eternity. Their hearts were pure. Okay, are you still with me? All right, so what I'm about to say here, just for all full disclosure, was a revelation that Angie gave me on the way, to, my wife gave me on the way to church last Sunday. So I don't want to take credit for it because it was really, I thought, incredible. Um, and I'm going to try to make this, it's a little bit of complexity to it, but I want to try to make it as simple as I can. I want you to turn to, this is still talking about our, our priesthood in the eternals, the eternal priesthood God is preparing. I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. And you know, hopefully you remember, that we did a whole series about Revelation 12 through 14 recently, where we talked about this passage of Scripture is a parenthesis, what scholars call a parenthetical section in the chronological storyline of the book of Revelation. It's a parenthesis. It doesn't follow the main chronological flow of the book of Revelation. It's a three chapters where it's like push, you take the remote controller and you push pause on the storyline where God goes deeper. This is Revelation 12 through 14 to give us a deeper view of what is really happening. But Angie mentioned this. And uh, on the way to church yesterday or last Sunday, and I was thinking, I love you. You're awesome. Wow, this is incredible. Okay, Revelation eleven nineteen. you know. And the temple of God 
which is in heaven, was opened. So just imagine John's on the Isle of Patmos, and all of a sudden the heavens open, and he beholds the temple of God, not the temple on the earth, the temple in heaven. He beholds the temple in heaven, and he sees the Ark of the Covenant in the temple. So what's he seeing? He's seeing the Holy of Holies. John's beholding in this vision the Holy of Holies of God's heavenly temple. And there were flashes and, and there were lightning and sounds and pills of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. But I th- the way Angie said to me, she said, you know, there's not chapter breaks in the original Greek. Is I think this verse is actually the beginning of Revelation 12 through 14. And I thought about that and I said, I think you're exactly right. What God is telling us is he's showing us in Revelation 12 through 14, he's showing us right before that in 11, 11, 19, this is what Revelation 12 through 14 is all about. It's about the holy of holies. That makes sense? It's about a people, and I can't go through the whole message I did. You can get it online about Revelation 12 through 14. But this this whole thing, God's showing us, here's the Holy of Holies, and Revelation 12 through 14 is about preparing a people for the Holy of Holies. Does that make sense? You're kind of looking at me like, uh, anyway, I won't go into all the details, but basically what we looked at, the woman in Revelation 12, the bride made ready throughout history, the birth of the man-child, the remnant in the church who, who overcome, who, are given, who the, the, is given birth at, at three and a half years before Christ comes back, the, the rest of her seed who are prepared and the woman in the, fleeing in the wilderness, all that we talked about, I'm not going to go into detail of that. We said basically that is how the bride is made ready at the end of the age, but it's also showing us that we are being prepared to be a people who dwell in the Holy of Holies. See, did you realize this? The bride of Christ is a priestly bride. Did you realize that when we're going to get the fine linen, white and clean, Revelation 19, 7 and 8, that those garments of fine linen, bright and clean, that the the priest in the Old Testament, they could not worship in the Holy of Holies without fine linen? In fact, Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 44, he said, you can't go into the Holy of Holies with anything like wool that makes you sweat. There can be no human effort that you can bring to the Holy of Holies, nothing that we accomplish for God, nothing of our human talent and creativity, nothing of the soul, nothing that we've accomplished by our own strength and power, nothing of soul power can come into the Holy of Holies. It is only that fine linen, white and clean, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, both imputed to us when we were born again and imparted to us by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us and then worked out into our nature, into our character, into our heart, into our soul. But the garment that clothes the bride for her wedding day is also the garment the bride will wear as a priest to minister in the Holy of Holies. The bride is a priestly bride. And her ministry is not an outer court ministry to the people. That doesn't mean there's not outer court ministry done, but it's not the primary focus of her ministry. The bride is a holy of holies ministry. Her ministry is to the Lord. And she's clothed in fine linen, Bright and clean. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. Or actually Revelation chapter 1. This hit me when we were worshiping today. As John was on the Isle of Patmos. He was out in secluded, he was basically in prison because of the word of God. On this island in seclusion because of the word of God, because of the testimony of Jesus. 
And John gets this just incredible vision. And in Revelation chapter 1, John is getting this revelation of Jesus Christ. This is John, by the way, who leaned his head against the heart of Jesus in his earthly life and was his most intimate best friend. You could argue that John was the closest of the disciples to Jesus. And yet when John sees him on the Isle of Patmos and the blazing glory of God, his face shining like the sun in his strength, his, from his mouth coming a sharp two-edged sword, Jesus, here I want you to catch this, he's emerging out of the holy of holies of heaven's temple. And in fact, you see it because there's a golden lampstand around that. You see, it's, it's the temple furniture you see in Revelation chapter 1. There was a golden lampstand that Jesus is emerging from. And he's emerging as a high priest of the holy of holies of heaven. In fact, he's, a, he's girded across his chest with a golden sash. That's, and he's got a robe reaching down to his feet. This is priestly talk. So Jesus, who is a priest, which Hebrews tells us, after the order of Melchizedek, this king priest in the holy of holies of God's heavenly temple is emerging out of the holy of holies to speak to John as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to explain what that big word means in a minute. But Jesus is going to, he approaches John, and John falls down on his face like a dead man. And he looks up, and from the mouth of Jesus Christ, guess what? There is a sword, think Hebrews 4.12, coming out of his, the high priest, his mouth, which is the word of God. I want to make the connection between Hebrews 4.12, the sword going into this, this division of soul and spirit into the heart with this call to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, after this, this holy of holy, kingly ministry that Jesus Christ has. Now, does that make sense? That's G in Hebrews chapter 6, talked about it. In fact, remember we talked a couple weeks ago, I said that I, I talked about becoming dull of hearing. Well, the author of Hebrews, when he talked about being dull of hearing, he wanted to teach them more about Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But because they had become dull of hearing, it was hard for him to explain it to them. You see what I'm saying? There's a connection between overcoming dullness of hearing and being able to understand the revelation of Jesus Christ as this high priest of the holy of holies of God's heavenly temple and as a king who's going to rule over all the nations. And your invitation to be invited into that. Now, look at this here. All that in mind, that's a mouthful. All of it's in the notes if you want to go back and dig into it, which I highly recommend that you do, is Revelation chapter 1. And, and by the way, let me just say this about the Melchizedek priesthood, just to make it really, really, really simple for us. It's a really long word. We all have this tendency when we hear long biblical words just to kind of dismiss it and say, okay, that's not really relevant to me. But this, what it means basically, this order of Melchizedek basically means in the old covenant that there was the office of priest and there was the office of king, but these two offices were separate. But a priest after the order of Melchizedek means the office of priest and the office of king have now been merged together so that the priest and king role are two roles in one calling. Does that make sense? So Jesus being a priest after the order of Melchizedek means he's both a priest who ministers to God in the Holy of Holies and he's a king who exercises authority and dominion over the nations. Our calling to be priests and kings after the order of Melchizedek means we are called to be a holy of holies priesthood that ministers to the Lord in the holy of holies and who comes out of the holy of holies and has authority over the nations as kings. That's, that's talking about in the age to come, though we do move in a dimension of that in this age. Now notice that. Here's Jesus coming out of the Holy of Holies of Heaven's temple with the golden lampstands next to him with a golden sash, the white robe. He's in the priestly attire. He's, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He comes out, and notice what John says in uh, verse 5. 
He talks about, he talks about uh, Jesus actually in verse 6. And he has made us to be, to be kings and priests to his God and Father. And so depending on the translation, I would look at the New King James Version translation. I think it's the best translation of what this means. Is God has called us to be kings and priests. That would begin now, but it spans throughout all eternity. That means we are called, our, our priestly calling is after the order of Melchizedek. It's not just a priestly order, but it's an, a kingly order as well. And so that is what we see in Revelation chapter 1, is that Jesus is emerging as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He then is, in, in fact, Revelation 2 and 3, he's going to call the church out of their compromise, out of their apathy, out of their indifference into this priesthood. Now, I remember uh, um, many years ago, or se probably five, seven years ago, I did a really, really serious in-depth study of Revelation 2 and 3 and all the different promises of Revelation 2 and 3. And what I walked away from in that study was, it just, just was like blaring at me, is these promises are about Jesus preparing not only the church to be a bride, not only the church to be overcomers, but he's preparing a priesthood. When I started looking at the promises, you know, like, like Jesus told the church of Pergamos, Pergamum, he said, if you overcome, if you overcome, I will give you some of the hidden manna. Now that hidden manna was the manna that was put into the Ark of the Covenant put into the Holy of Holies. What he's saying here, if you overcome, I will give you the hidden manna in the Holy of Holies. He's basically saying, this is so incredible. I will give you for all of eternity a communing experience with me in the Holy of Holies. I will allow you to dine with me in the richest communion and intimacy you can even fathom. If you overcome. What an incredible promise. This is a holy of holies promise he's offering us. I, you know, just reading through it, just seeing even the church of Sardis. If you overcome, I will give you the white garments. Those garments are not just white, but they're linen garments, which are the priestly garments. Revelation to the promise to the church of Philadelphia. If you overcome, you will be a pillar in God's temple, talking about the heavenly temple. And you will not go out from it anymore. Meaning you will have a permanent dwelling place in the holy of holy, holies, holy of holies of God's temple. And when I started seeing this, I'm like, these, are, these promises are so, are so much about the priesthood. These are about, and, and you throw in then, if you overcome... I will give you the throne of God. You will sit as a king on the throne of God with me. If you overcome Jezebel, I will give you authority over the nations. See, the promises of Revelation 2 and 3 is Jesus offering to the church the invitation to be a Melchizedek priesthood, a priestly ministry and a kingly ministry. You with me? Some of y'all are zoning out, I think. Hopefully you come back. This is not just, again, this, is, this pertains to your destiny now. This pertains to your destiny now. Reading Revelation chapter 3, you just think about this. He, he begins to speak to the church of Sardis. And he says, you are asleep. Wake up. He tells the church of Sardis, wake up. Your garments, your priestly garments have been defiled. Wake up. See, what we see here is Jesus calling to awaken the bride. So we have this trajectory of the priesthood from the bride who's asleep to Jesus awakening the bride. And if you don't realize that Jesus right now is calling out to the church right now, who's sound asleep, by the way, 
wake up. Wake up. He's saying the same thing he said to Sardis. Wake up. You're asleep. Wake up. And those who wake up are given this white garment to wear as the awakened bride. And then we move on to Philadelphia, where if you study the church of Philadelphia, they were the one, they were one of the, there's two churches that had already overcome, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that Jesus did not rebuke. But Jesus talks to the church of Philadelphia and he says, if you overcome, if you maintain your victory that you already have until the end, I will make you a pillar in the temple of God and I will write the new city Jerusalem on your forehead. This is a holy of holies, priestly promise he's given to that church, to the overcomers. He's given to us to say, if you overcome, you will be a priest in the holy of holies of God's temple. And then we go to Laodicea. We've got the awakened bride, the priestly bride, and then we've got the enthroned bride that if you will overcome lukewarmness, if you will overcome self-satisfaction, if you will overcome this tendency to be absorbed with the things of this life to the point where it dulls your heart, to the point where it dulls your hearing, to the point where you are satisfied and lukewarm and that passion you had for the Lord is kind of cooled off and the, and the burning passion you once had is no longer there. If you will overcome all those things, I will give you my throne and you will sit down with me on my throne. That's incredible the kindness of God to us. And then we get to Revelation 19.7, which we've talked about just a million times here. The bride has made herself ready. This is after the great tribulation. This is right as Jesus is coming back. At that point, the church finally makes herself ready as the bride, and is given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. I want you to, you probably don't, we probably just scan right over that phrase, fine linen. Have you ever thought about that? And from what I've already said, you see, this bride is a priestly bride. The linen is because she's being clothed in this linen to go into the Holy of Holies, into her ministry to the Lord in the Holy of Holies. Just like Mary of Bethany in John chapter 12, where she broke the alabaster vial, which was basically a, a whole year's worth of income. She broke it. And the disciples like, why this waste on on, on this waste that you're pouring on Jesus, why are you wasting this money? You're wasting your life, Mary. Why are you wasting your life? Well, Mary was a picture of the bride of Jesus Christ, whose first ministry is to the Lord and the Holy of Holies. And to some who are professionals in the church, it might look as if, well, you're wasting your life, spending so much time worshiping and so much time prayer and so much time just waiting on the Lord in silence and trying to hear what he's saying. You're wasting your life. I think the Lord would say, no, your ministry is to me first. Your ministry is to me first in the Holy of Holies. Just to say, Let's turn to Ezekiel. I want us to see this real quick. Ezekiel 44, verse 17. And I'm going to explain this, this prophecy here. Ezekiel 40, Ezekiel 40 through 48, if you try to read, you know, if you, if you read that, you're going to probably be really confused. And there's a huge debate about this prophecy. The, is this prophecy future? Is this prophecy spiritual? Has this prophecy already been fulfilled? 
And there's a lot to that. I'm not going to go into that today. But what I want to draw from Ezekiel chapter 44 is the principle we see is there is a priesthood within the priesthood. And I would say in the church today, there is a priesthood within the priesthood. Much of the church, like we see in Ezekiel 44, is like the Levitical priesthood. They're satisfied with the outer court. They're satisfied with keeping the machine running. They're satisfied with ministry to the people. They're satisfied with doing things for God. I'm not, again, I'm not saying there's not a place to do things for God. I mean, we actually do and by God's power. But there is a place where God anoints us for ministry. But the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood was in Ezekiel 44, and it was actually God's judgment. Still his people. But because of the compromise in their lives, because of the way they had compromised, God judged them and said to them, you have an outer court ministry and you're not permitted to minister to me. And I believe we see that principle in the church today. So much of the church is content in the outer court, content with salvation, content with just going to church and having a ticket to heaven, content with doing things for God, that they stay in the outer court. Some move past the outer court and they get preoccupied with the things of God, moving in the gifts of the Spirit, which I totally am for and believe in. And we should move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But they get preoccupied with the things of God instead of the God of all things. They get preoccupied with an it instead of a person. They get preoccupied with some doctrine, some teaching, some facet, and, and instead of that intimate relationship with the person. And they stay in the holy place. But God is bringing those in his church who are hungry. He's bringing them into the holy of holies. Into a deep, intimate relationship with him. Into what Jesus talked about, a dining relationship where we have a conversation with him. You know, you can hear God speak and you can have a, a relationship with him of, of dialogue. And I'm not saying every, you know, you're, some people get weird with, weird with this and they just walk around thinking, well, God told me, God told me, God told me, God told me. If you've ever been around people like that, they annoy you in about you know, 30 seconds. But I'm not talking about something weird, but there is, there is really this dynamic you can have of communion and dining with Jesus in the secret place. And it's beautiful. And so God is calling out to the church, come out of the outer court. Don't stay in the outer court any longer. Don't even camp out in the holy place, which is good. Come further to him in a holy of holies, intimate relationship of dining and communing with him, of ministry to him. That's the Zadok priesthood, Ezekiel 44, the priesthood within the priesthood. There is a priesthood within the priesthood. And God is asking us the question, do you want to be one of those who ministers in the outer court, who keeps the machine running? Now, don't get me wrong as a church, we need, we need that because we do need to keep the machine running. But it can still flow out of a holy place, holy of holies relationship with him. See, do you want to just be one who only keeps the machine running, who only wants to minister to people? So much of, of the church, so many leaders have found their identity in outer court ministry of ministering to the people that they don't have a ministry to the Lord in the, holies, in the holy of holies. To minister in a, to an audience of one where if no one else sees you but God, you're satisfied. If no one else hear, ever hears your voice but God himself, you're happy. God may or may not thrust you out to give you influence. God may or may not give you a platform. God may or may not give you an external ministry. 
Are you okay with that? Is, is he really the ministry that you want, or do you want an outer court ministry to the people? Because if you want an outer court ministry to the people, he will give it to you, but usually there's a price we pay for saying, I want to minister in the outer court rather than the Holy of Holies, which is what happened to the Levitical priesthood. They, their compromise led them into the outer court where they were uh, not permitted to come near to him. But to come near to him is a price. To come near to him, there's a price. I want you to turn to Ezekiel 44. Verse 17. Talking about the Zadok priesthood, the priesthood within the priesthood. Just to give you an idea what Zadok is, Zadok, when King David was um, king, there was a rebellion that took place. Absalom tried to rebel against David and said, I'm really the king. And most of Israel followed after Absalom. And the Levitical priesthood followed after Absalom. But there was a priest named Zadok, a high priest named Zadok, who said, I am not going to go the way of Israel. I'm going to stay loyal to the Lord, to his king, and to his anointed. Zadok, which actually that name means righteous, Zadok was an overcomer. He's a picture of the overcomers. He's a picture of the priesthood God's raising up. And the Lord promises in Ezekiel 44, I will give the sons of Zadok a ministry to me in the Holy of Holies. And they will minister to me. Here's what it says about the Zadok priesthood, that it, it shall be when they enter at the gates of the inner court. Or you could say, in, as they come to the Holy of Holies, they shall be clothed with linen garments. Think Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Think of those fine linen garments. See yourself here as a son or daughter of Zadok, clothing yourself with what the righteousness of Jesus Christ and what is worked into you at salvation by the indwelling Holy Spirit, and what is worked out of you from him into your heart and soul, into your life. Here's what it says. This is, I want you to hear this. And wool shall not be on them while they are ministering in the gates of the inner court and in the house. He goes on to say, down at the bottom of verse 18, they shall not gird themselves with anything that makes them sweat. If we're going to have a ministry to the Lord in the Holy of Holies, we cannot wear anything in there that makes us sweat. Anything of the flesh. Anything of human productivity. Anything of human wisdom anything of human efficiency, anything of human intelligence, human creativity, human talent. The only thing that comes into the Holy of Holies, listen, the only thing that comes into the Holy of Holies is the man Christ Jesus and what is born and, and formed of this man Christ by his spirit. There is no other man in the Holy of Holies. There is no other preaching of men in the Holy of Holies. I don't care how anointed and great the man of God is. When you come into the Holy of Holies, there is but one man who is proclaimed in the Holy of Holies, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. That's why Isaiah, when he saw the man in the Holy of Holies, he realized, I have been preaching another man himself. I have been about myself. I have been about self-promotion. I have been about selfish ambition. I have been about selfish preservation. I have been about self-righteousness. It's been all about me. And when you come into the holy of holies where God dwells, it's nothing of the flesh, nothing that makes you sweat. It is Christ and Christ alone. And so, 
Some of us just need to take off that garment of working for God, of trying to do things so God will like me, of trying to do things so God will accept me, of trying to build a tower to Babel that reaches up to heaven to make my name great and what I've done in the name of Jesus great. Do you realize so much of the church is basically working and doing things for God and they're putting the name of Jesus on it and they're saying, they're basically building the Tower of Babel in the name of Jesus. Because you can get a big, massive following if you do things in your own human effort and your own human creativity and put the name of Jesus on it. Most of the church doesn't, can't even recognize, no, that is still the power of the soul in operation. The soul has to come down I want to say the soul, the soul power and living from the soul and operating out of the soul has to be uh, replaced in exchange for living by the power of the Spirit of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, those who are controlled by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. The Holy of Holies. You can't wear anything into the Holy of Holies that makes you sweat. You can't do anything for God in the power of your soul. It must be what Christ has done for you on the cross and what the Spirit has done in you because of the cross. And you, living from the Spirit of God in your human spirit, grafted and joined together as one with the Holy Spirit, and Him filling your heart, and then Him permeating your mind, your will, and emotions, and Him working out into your body and how you speak and what you do and what you say and where you go. That is what it means to be led by the Spirit of God, and that's what it means to be clothed in fine linen. Fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. It's what we do from our initial justification. When Jesus says, you are declared righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ, my righteousness is now imputed to you. Not only is my righteousness imputed to you, my righteousness is imparted into the very fabric of your human spirit because the Spirit of God dwells in your human spirit. Making your spirit righteous is beautiful. Ephesians 4.24, put on the new man who in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. One-third of you is already saved. One-third of you is already righteous. That part of you, your spirit, in union with the Holy Spirit, as you allow that part of you to live and work itself out into your heart, into your soul, outward into your body, outward into your speech, outward in what you do, outward in what you say, as you allow that to happen, you are then putting on those fine linen garments that will permit you to come into the Holy of Holies both now and for all eternity to minister to him as a priest after the order of Melchizedek as a Zadok priesthood. God is raising up in this hour a Zadok priesthood. God is moving into the church of Jesus Christ right now, separating. By the way, God is separating in his church. God is doing a work of separation. And I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about globally. There is a work of the Lord going on right now where God is separating in his church. God is dividing in his church. The Lord is wanting to raise up a Zadok priesthood, a, a priestly bride that ministers to the Lord in the Holy of Holies and fine linen with nothing that makes her sweat. That is why God is coming to us. That is why God is dealing with 
our heart. That is why God is dealing with our soul, is he wants a priesthood for himself. Let me just say one thing. Turn to, turn to just real quick, we're almost at the end here. Everyone's favorite part of the message. Hebrews 5.10 Talking about Jesus Christ, he has been designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So the priesthood Jesus operates from is not the Levitical priesthood. He can never be part of the Levitical priesthood because he's not from the tribe of, of uh, Levi, or was it Levi? Levi. Or he's not part of that tribe. He had to institute an entirely new priesthood. And that's what he did in the new covenant. Again, Melchizedek means the, the role of priest and king have been merged into one office. And so Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I want you to notice something really interesting. I, I, I'm convinced that it's, the, it's one of those things that only God could do. Is if you take that Hebrew word Melchizedek and you actually look into the Hebrew, um, and, you, and you break it apart, you can actually see Zadok, that Holy of Holies ministry we see in Ezekiel 44. You can see it in the, in the, uh, the, um, the word Melchizedek. This word in the Hebrew is, and I'm going to prob probably pronounce the Hebrew wrong, but Malki Tzedek, Malki Tzedek. Malki comes from the Hebrew word, which means king, and Sedek comes from the word, the same word from which Zadok is derived, means righteousness. So even if you were to take the word Melchizedek and you put a hyphenation between the I and the Z, Melchi, Sedek, you see Zadok right in this order of this priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. See, do you see this, this type and shadow in the way God weaves it into his word? This Zadok priesthood is part of this Melchizedek priesthood, which is a ministry to the Lord in the Holy of Holies. And so just to bring this message to a close, this is not just some random teaching that has no relevance. This is your destiny. God is marking those in his church to be part of his priesthood. God is marking those. God is separating in his church those who would want a holy of holies priesthood and those who are content in the outer court, those who are satisfied in the holy place. This is not just pertaining to the here and now, but for all eternity. You are being prepared to be this priesthood who ministers in the holy of holies for all of eternity. And what determines whether or not we'll be part of that is the condition of our heart. It's the condition of our heart. And that's why we're going to allow the Lord over the the next however long he wants to, to speak, to, to really go deep into the heart. I, I don't know about you. I know I, I, I don't want any impurities in my heart. I don't want any. I, I want to, I mean, my life goes by, it's gone by already way too fast. I want to be on that day when I stand before him, him to look at me and to say, you have a pure heart. You're like Nathaniel in whom there is no guile. I want that to be true in my heart. I don't want anything in my heart to be there that is impure. Anything that is lust or bitterness or unforgiveness or offense or pride or, you know, I, you know whatever else. Unbelief, doubt, selfishness, self-centeredness, lukewarmness, indifference, apathy, 
I don't want any of that to be in my heart. I want my heart to be clean and pure before him with nothing in there but Christ. God, I pray that you would do that work in us. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It's not automatic because you're born again that your heart is pure. We must constantly have the fresh circumcision of the Spirit of God moving to cut away the influence of the flesh and the soul, the self-life, so that Christ possesses our heart in fullness. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I, I just can tell that everyone listening, I can tell everyone listening really has that heart for you, Lord. They have that heart who says, I want my heart to be pure. Lord, I want to pray that you would begin a work in us, Lord, of going deeper than we've ever gone, Lord, into this division of soul and spirit. In the context of a priesthood being prepared, Lord, would you do this deep probing in our heart, this deep penetration of your word into our heart as the high priest who wants us to be with you in the Holy of Holies. Lord, I am asking you to do a deep work of purity, a deep work of holiness, that you would cleanse our heart from whatever it might be, hurts, wounds, bitterness, offense, pride, selfishness, lust, jealousy, judgment, criticism. Lord, that you might truly do that heart surgery in us, Lord that Christ might dwell in our heart fully, richly, without any competition, without any rival in our heart. Be the king of our heart, Lord. Be the king of our heart. Dethrone self from the heart and install yourself as king in our heart. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.